welcome to another talk by the Malta Airport Foundation. Today, I have the honor of hosting here with me, Dr. Stanley Farouja Randon, who is a medical doctor, a specialist in family medicine by profession, with a very strong interest in Malta's environmental and cultural history. Dr. Farouja Randon has in fact written and quoted several books on these subjects, and he has also been a council member for the NGO Dean Lart Helwa for more than 25 years. Today, we shall be speaking about a project that the Malta Airport Foundation has given to Dean Lart Helwa for the restoration of the 17th century coastal watchtower, Tashutu in Wit Izurria. Dr. Randon, thank you very much for being here with us today. Welcome. This project, the restoration of the Tori Tashutu, it took five whole years to restore this watchtower. What were the challenges you encountered and how did the financial support from the Malta Airport Foundation help you do it? Restoration of a historical site is always a challenge because the sites are usually graded grade one. That is, they are given the highest level possible of uh, importance. Mm -hmm. And so when you have to do something, you have to do it right. You cannot do mistakes. Uh, when we secure the funds, and that is where Malta Foundation came in, Airport Foundation came in, when we, decide, when we said, okay, we have the funds to do this project, it is there where everything started. Okay. So when we secured the funds, then we started from scratch. So we appointed an architect, as we do after all with every restoration project, we apply to the authorities, we discuss what is the best way how to restore the place, and then we appoint uh, different uh, contractors to give us obviously their estimate of costs. And you would imagine this process takes, takes a, a long, long time, time because there are different steps which one has to follow because we are doing something after all to the public, to the nation. We, it is not ours, although we are taking care of it. We are guardians of the place. Mm -hmm. The place is still public. It's still of the, of the country. So it is important that we do things as they should be. Mm -hmm. That is why restoration projects usually take long. And when you decide on who you're going to work with, you suddenly get the planning authority go ahead to start restoring. The contractor which you have, which you have uh, had already appointed, is not going to tell you, "Okay, I can start tomorrow." So yeah, you would imagine that these things uh, are a process. Even while we are restoring, we start discovering things. For example, we discovered the gallery when we were restoring the environment of the tower, okay. and we we discovered also a cesspit, for example. So we had to see why these were used. We had to inform the superintendents of cultural heritage with whom we have regular meetings and regular talks on site. So yes, these things uh, take a lot, a lot, a lot of time. Now a tower like that must have ample untold stories, things we might not know about or imagine. Can you give us an insight maybe on some of these? Yes, probably most of these stories unfortunately have been lost in history, but to mention maybe two, uh, one of them, the site where the tower was built on, was previously used uh, as an observation post during the medieval period, mm -hmm. and it was called Mahras, okay, okay. from the uh, from the Arabic word, Semitic word Haris, um, and it was probably, most probably, the first place to see the Ottoman fleet coming in into our islands, attacking our islands in 1565 during the Great Siege. Wow, that's interesting. The tower wasn't there. The course. tower wasn't there. And when then Grandmaster Lascaris decided that there should be a tower built in its place, mm -hmm. the tower replaced that uh, Mahras. Um, it was used also uh, as an observation post during the World Wars. And for example, during World War II, uh, they used to um, light searchlights, even to inform the, uh, the fishermen that, for example, attacks were coming, or else when they used to use filfla as a target practice. Mm. 
mm. because filfla close by was used Just as a target opposite. practice. Mm -hmm. And so when they decided that it was time that they should use it as a target practice, they had to inform the fishermen and the, uh, the people who used to use the sea, were on sea, that uh, it's going to, filfla is going to be bombarded. So they used to inform the, the fishermen. Um, and once there was an, an incident where the fishermen did not notice, they noticed that the aeroplanes are coming mm -hmm. and there were fishermen close by and they had to literally started shouting, started doing all types of noises so that at least the fishermen would have noticed in time before the bombardment of uh, Phil Flood as a target practice started. And it seems that they managed to to uh, to note on notice on time and uh, they, they, were at least they were safe. <laughs> they were safe. That's very interesting. Um, how did COVID nineteen and the drastic drop in tourist numbers impact Dean Lart Helua? I know you actually take care of a lot of cultural sites, no? Yes. Um, the year before COVID started, we had about ninety thousand visitors in our, on all our sites. And that went down to 15,000 last year. So you would imagine the, uh, the drastic change that there was, especially because 90% of our visitors are tourists. Okay. And so it was, yes, a quite a big blow to us because uh, economically we thrive on the admission, admissions um, of people who visit our sites. Remember that these sites have to be continuously maintained. We don't need only to pay for electricity, insurances, um, water we sometimes use, um, but we have to also maintain them because they are old sites, they need continu continuous maintenance. So once you take them under your arms, you actually continue following the whole... Definitely, definitely, building. yes, definitely. That's why we are guardians, because we're giving guardianship usually for a number of years. You see, it's not just one year, we restore it and that's it. We continue to follow up, yes. Did you find yourself being innovative in ways to attract people to your sites? At times, yes, we tried. For example, we tried to communicate more uh, online with people um, through our website as well. And we tried to organize uh, events uh, um, uh, which were obviously under control uh, according to uh, what the health authorities were informing us to do. Uh, which were maybe sm much smaller, maybe sporadic visits mm -hmm. and these things. Yes, so we tried to be, yes, at least uh, um, uh, for people who uh, wanted to visit the site even for educational purposes. We get a lot of uh, children who communicate with us that they want to visit the site because they're doing a project, for example, at school. Mm -hmm. And we had to still accommodate these people, so we had to try to uh, see how we could send the information, maybe somebody goes and open for them. You see, we, we, we make our available historical information we have and maybe plans of site plans of the site. Very interesting. Um, do you think that local people should appreciate more such sites? Do you think that it's time for local tourism to start picking up and visit these sites? Definitely. As I said before, 90% of people who visit these sites are tourists. Um, That's why I'm asking, how, how can we um, entice the general public to come and visit these sites? Many of our volunteers who open the sites are, are foreigners, okay, who, who live in Malta. Um, I, I see the next generation being better, maybe even because, as I have already mentioned before, at school children are, are made to visit these sites, you see, to take more interest in these sites. Mm -hmm. So yes, I, I don't see any difference in, uh, in generations who are, for example, let's just try throw a figure, 50 plus. But I see as yes, an improvement in the generations, in the younger, in the younger generation, yes. That is something very worth noting and hopefully it will continue uh, also post COVID times. Sure. <laughs> uh, finally, uh, what would your message be to anyone watching who would like to become a volunteer in a local NGO or particularly in an NGO like Din Lartelua? In fact, during these difficult times, we found help. 
apart from help from uh, Malt Enterprise and the Council for Voluntary Sector, we also found a lot of help from our corporate members who became, who renewed or became corporate members of Dinlart Helwa, of members, specific members who donated um, uh, funds so that we'll be able to overcome this difficult time. So, first of all, yes, we have found already that help. Uh, they give us financial help. Mm -hmm. But most of all, we also need voluntary help. Um, it is difficult to find people who uh, come and spend two, three or four hours a week, not saying a day, obviously, a week, to open our sites. But uh, at least, yes, it, we, we do manage to find the people who are interested as I said, both foreigners who come and live in our country, as well as Maltese. So yes, um, uh, that would be the best help that uh, people could give us. And so that they voluntarily open yeah. our sites. That's great. Anyone interested in doing so, watching us, can contact the Lart Helwa and become a volunteer, of course, under uh, your guidance. Before we close, if I come to Tashutu, what can I say? Luckily, Tashutu was not changed a lot. So um, although it has been there for about 400 years, it didn't change much. Um, maybe because it's, it was in isolation, you see. And so there were not a lot of uh, um, buildings added to it uh, during the centuries. So at least you can see its originality. You see how it was built uh, as it should have been as a coastal tower. You won't see all that much, apart from obviously the history. There are uh, there's documentation about its history inside the tower. Um, it's actually made of two rooms, one below and one above. Mm -hmm. But first of all, its architecture is quite unique uh, because you find it uh, in. It's typical for Maltese architecture, but uh, you don't find it in many other places in the world. Um, the, the, the arches and the and the beams, the, the beams, the stone beams which cross from one arch to another. But and then you've got the marvelous view from the roof, which is uh, a very, very, very lovely view. And you can admire the island of Filfla from up there and the beautiful views both in summer and as well as in winter. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you for the very valid work you do to protect our heritage. And of course, anybody listening to us, please go and visit Tashutu Tower because it's something very spectacular and as Dr. Farooja Randon just explained, very authentic as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for following us and please stay safe. Mm -hmm.